to record. So we practiced mark recapture and we did some random sampling and stratified random sampling with sessile organisms like plants or, or possibly clams or mussels on rocks. So we did a mark recapture study in Costa Rica. I was there on this field course. That's one of the best things I've ever done with education was go on a field course. I'd highly recommend if you get it, an opportunity to go to Bamfield on Vancouver Island or somewhere else on a field course, I would highly recommend it. Although you might think, well, maybe not when you've heard the story, but <laughs> we were counting uh, bullet ants and bullet ants are large ants and they live underground uh, near the, the roots of, of trees. And so we captured a bunch of them very carefully and we marked them with um, white out that was at the end of a very long stick so we didn't have to get too close to them. And then we let them back in the population. We did a recapture um, and made an estimate of the population size. But the thing is that one thing about being in a tropical place is that there are a lot of insects and there's a lot of things that will bite you. And the bullet ant is one of them and it's actually quite a powerful bite. Um, I never got one myself, but it's apparently like hitting yourself in the same place with a baseball bat several times. So it's quite painful apparently. And so I was a bit jumpy and uh, somebody poked me in the back of the leg as a joke while we were collecting. And I jumped a mile high and I turned around and I kicked him in the shins as hard as I could. It was just a gut reaction. <laughs> anyway, he apologized and we were still friends after that. So that was good. Um, okay, so I'd like to do something else here, which is I'm going to bring up your picture so I can see that if you have any questions. Okay, now let's go to our next topic which is dispersion. So when you're sampling, it's important that you know how your population is dispersed. Is it a clump dispersion? Like on the mountain, for example, would most of the plants be on the sunny side or are they shade tolerant plants? Where would you find them? Um, so a clump dispersion is where individuals aggregate in patches. And often it is influenced by resource availability. So in this case, these are, these are wolves and they live in groups to improve the effectiveness of hunting. And so you might find them in a clumped population. So it's diagrammatically shown here. These are clumps of wolves. It might be a very large area. Um, so that, that's a behavioral thing, the wolves um, hunting in packs. For resource availability, so for example, uh, long riversides, you will find a lot of willow trees. So willows grow in saturated water or saturated soil along lake sides or riversides. So they tend to be a clumped distribution. A uniform dispersion is such where the individuals are very evenly distributed. Sometimes that's influenced by social interactions like territoriality. So this diagram here shows penguins. They're defending a very small territory where they're laying eggs and they have a young in that small territory, but they defend it against all the other ones. So they are more uniformly distributed. So they would be more predictable to, to find any uniform dispersion. Sometimes organisms are just dispersed randomly. So the position of individuals are independent of other individuals like windblown seeds, for example. They land randomly in different places in a field and that's where they germinate. And that's just um, 
a random dispersion. So how do we measure population size? Well, between the processes that add individuals to a population and those that remove individuals from it. So we need to know these numbers. What adds to a population? Uh, births? Plus immigration. Those two things must be taken into consideration for population growth. What decreases a population? Emigration. And deaths. Demography is the study of the vital statistics of a population in which we're looking at death rates, birth rates, immigration numbers, immigration numbers, and we can estimate the intrinsic rate of population growth, which is, or we have to know, sorry, the intrinsic rate of population growth, which is how many offspring individuals have. So addition is birth and survivability at different ages and immigration, subtraction, we subtract those that have died, mortality and emigration. And we look at the age structure of a population. So the age structure is the relative number of individuals of each age. And that's important for determining future birth rates and death rates. So the birth rate, otherwise known as fecundity, is usually highest in the middle age of the population. The death rate, however, is usually highest at very low ages because lower aged individuals are more vulnerable to predators, for example, and high age when age just simply catches up to an individual and they don't survive over a certain age. The term generation time is the average time between birth and having offspring. And that varies wildly amongst uh, different animal populations and plant populations. So for humans, what is human uh, generation time? Probably 25 years, but it depends where you are in the world even, which, which a local population you're looking at. So, I think in Ireland, it's considerably higher. I know that the, the average age of a uh, woman giving birth at Grace Hospital one year was, I think it was 37 one year. So it's quite high. So it depends. It depends on the location. So we might look at a life table to give us an idea or we get data to give us an idea of the survival pattern of a population. And we'll follow a cohort. A cohort is the, are the individuals born in one year. In a given year. And we'll follow them. And we'll see, you know, how many die in their first year of life, in their second year, in their third year. Uh, so we're interested in the start of the year, there's 337 alive there. At the end of 10 years, there's only one that's still alive out of that cohort. So the longevity, the expected longest longevity of individuals in this population is probably 10 years. Um, the death rate early on in the first year was 61%, so that's quite high. So we look at the number that were alive in the start of the year, 337. The number of deaths were 207. So that's 61%, so that's quite high. Uh, the following year, there's still 252 individuals alive, but 125 died that year. That's 50% of the population. Now there are only 127 individuals and so on. So you go through uh, the uh, different ages, you follow this cohort for an entire 10 years. A lot of population studies tend to be long-term studies. 
because um, a lot of species live a long time. If you were to study elephants, for example, you're looking at a hundred or greater year lifespan of an individual. So you would have to collect data for a hundred years or longer. So that's the females. And then you can also look at the males. So that's a summary of survival pattern. And the thing about uh, populations and estimating populations and what happens to them over time, tables are fine, but you know, you really want to look at graphs. And graphs give you a lot of information. So here's a graphic way of presenting data in a life table. This is called a survivorship curve. That means that on the y-axis is shown the number of survivors, the survivorship curve. So in the beginning, we had 1,000 individuals. And what happened to those over the next 10 years? So we can see right away that um, there was a higher, higher death rate for males. And males tended to um, die younger. The females tended to live longer. So there was a higher survivorship of females in the population. And another thing that's interesting is that the death rate is relatively constant with this particular species. In other words, um, death by uh, whatever the death, the reason for deaths are, it's usually predators or lack of food, is constant throughout each age group. But that's not true of all species. Sorry, I went one too far there. These are different kinds of survivorship curves. They're classified into three general types, type one, type two, and type three. Humans belong in the type one survivorship curve in that um, survival, survival is high up into the age of about 80, and then survival tends to decline. So high survivorship early on in life and less later on. The squirrel we just saw had type two survivorship. So a even number of deaths per year. Other organisms like this oyster, um, oysters have a different kind of survivorship. There's lots and lots of deaths in the beginning, but some individuals live for quite a long time. This is percentage of lifespan, by the way, here. Percentage of lifespan. So um, those, those require different strategies. For the oyster, in order for some individuals of the population to live a long time and long enough to have offspring, the oyster has to have a lot of eggs and offspring. Whereas humans, survivorship is high. So humans have usually one individual per, per episode of, uh, of um, breeding. The belding squirrel, which has a fairly even death rate, um, they breed more often and they have more in each litter. So they're sort of in between having a few to having very many offspring early on. A reproductive table can show the reproductive patterns of a population. Uh, the proportion of females, this is for Belding's ground squirrels again, um, so the age of females and the proportion of females that are weaning a litter. So for age zero to one, none of them do. So the age of maturation for building ground squirrels is between the ages of one and two. And that's when they start to produce young. Eventually, all females in the population will produce young. So it, it is a yearly event. Um, life history traits are products of natural selection. So whatever environment organisms find themselves in that has determined the kind of survivorship curve or the kind of uh, breeding style or number of offspring that they have. So it's reflected in development, 
It's reflected in the physiology and behavior of an organism. And they're very, they're very diverse. For example, some species um, exhibit what's known as semel parity. Semel parity, uh, big bang reproduction. So produce, reproduce a single time and die. That's what this salmon, this is a sockeye salmon. All salmon exhibit this style of reproduction. So why is that? Well, the salmon produces a lot of eggs, say 2,000 or so eggs in a stream. And when the eggs hatch, they have to have the best chance of survival possible. Not that many survive due to predation, but the parents dying adds nutrition to a river and that nutrition increases the productivity and increases the chance of survivorship of the young. And that's called semel parity. Uh, Itero parity are species that exhibit repeated reproduction, producing offspring repeatedly over time. So that includes humans, of course, and meerkats. Um, well, there are trade-offs to when to reproduce and how many offspring to have. So there's a trade-off between your own survival and having offspring and their survival. Because organisms have finite resources. There's just a certain number of resources that that individuals have. So this shows uh, survival rates of kestrels, it's a kind of bird, and whether or not they have a very large brood size or number of offspring, a normal one or a reduced one or reduced. So these are the males in blue and the females in pink. And this is the parent surviving the following winter. You can see that in the reduced brood size, survivorship is much higher for both. With a normal brood size, it's about 60%. Uh, With a very large brood size, however, it, it looks like there is lower survivorship because a lot of the resources and energy is expended on the offspring and not on the individual. So some plants strategy is to produce a large number of small seeds. That way, some of them will grow and eventually reproduce. Weedy plants tend to have that strategy, like dandelions, for example. Some produce a moderate number of very large seeds, but those large seeds are likely to survive because they have their own store of energy and that helps the seedlings become established. These are coconut palms. Um, having a, a parental care of smaller broods may also facilitate, facilitate survival of the offspring. So there is less competition between offspring if the brood is smaller. So let's look at how populations grow over time. There are two kinds of, the main kinds of population growth, exponential growth and logistical growth. How do populations grow over time? These are growth models. So assuming for an ideal population growth model, we've got a small group of individuals, unlimited resources. Here are some symbols in this equation. The change in population number so you have to establish the timing yourself, but it's usually from one year to the next. Uh, delta T is a change in time. B stands for the number of births during that time, and D stands for the number of deaths during that time. So the change in population size over a, a certain time period, the change in time is equal to the births minus the deaths. So that's quite logical. So if we, um, if we look at that equation, 
and say we have a birth rate of 0.34 and a death rate of, or sorry, 0.034 and a death rate of 0.016 per year. We're looking at the change in time. Uh, we can take out the n, I forget what this is called, it's in mathematical terms. And then we have n times the difference between births and deaths. The difference between birth and death. And we're going to give that a little r. Then we have the change in population size over the change in time is equal to little r times the initial population. And that is our intrinsic rate of growth. So at any instant in time, our population will grow by whatever uh, rate little r is, our intrinsic rate of growth. That's a generalized equation. So uh, if, we, if we ignore immigration and immigration, then a population's growth rate equals the birth rate minus the death rate. So that makes sense. If there's zero population growth, well, birth rate equals the death rate. And this is the population growth equation. Exponential growth is a population increase under very idealized conditions. There will be no limit of resources for exponential growth. So reproduction rate is at its maximum. That's known as R max. The intrinsic rate of increase isn't limited by anything. And that results in exponential growth, which will look like a J curve. So in this case, a little r is 1. In this case, little r is 0.5. So when little r is 1, it's a very steep and very fast rate of growth. When little r, or the intrinsic rate, is 0.5, it's a bit slower, but it's still exponential. On the y-axis is population size, or big N. And on the x-axis is time, or in this case, exhibited as number of generations. Exponential growth. Uh, do populations exhibit exponential growth? Sometimes they do. Yeah. So a population, for example, might be rebounding. There, it might have been reduced by, for some reason, by uh, some kind of weather event, a catastrophic event, possibly hunting, or something like that. But if it's rebounding in an area where resources are unlimited, then it will show exponential growth. So these are elephants. This is in 1900 when the elephant trade was really large for ivory. Uh, eventually, there was a ban, an international ban, at least you know, an agreement that elephants wouldn't be hunted for ivory and the population rebounded. But exponential growth has to be curbed at some point because resources are limited. They're limited. It can't be sustained for a long in any population exponential growth. It either crashes or it levels off steadily. So a, a more realistic model, I guess, incorporates something known as carrying capacity. The most number of individuals that that particular environment can support. That's called the logistic growth model. So what happens in a logistic growth model is the per capita rate of increase declines when the carrying capacity is reached because there is with, because with more individuals, there is greater competition for resources and a higher likelihood of death. So the carrying capacity is the maximum population size that the environment can support. Here is the equation. The logistic growth equation includes K, which is the carrying capacity. So we've still got our change in population over time, our intrinsic rate of growth, At any given time, R max is when there are no uh, limitations. But now we've limited this by K, the carrying capacity. 
So if our population size is greater than K, the number of individuals will start to reduce. If the population size is less than K, the population size will continue to grow. So if N, I don't have to do that. If N less than K, population growing. If N is greater than K, the resources will be even more limiting and the population will decline. So a hypothetical example of, pop, of logistic growth. So um, our max here is 0.05 per individual per year. Um, you can start with a population size of 20. You include, you include the intrinsic rate of increase. Um, you calculate your um, qualifying equation and you get your per capita increase and population growth rate. So looking at that is much, much easier on a graph. So looking at a graph, here's an example of population exponential growth, the J curve. So that's where DNDT equals one. So one increase in population per individual per time period. Um, but the carrying capacity is 1,500. Therefore, if we add 1,500 to where the K is, the carrying capacity, we'll find that the population will get lower and lower until it reaches carrying capacity, until N equals 1,500. And then there will just be a steady population size after that point. So does that fit real populations, logistic models? Um, it tends to, but there are lots of exceptions to that rule. So this is um, paramecia. You remember the protist that we studied, the paramecia, a population that's grown in the lab. These are the cultures here. And the population grew and grew until the resources started to be limiting and the population size itself leveled out. So that makes sense. Some populations overshoot, that's very common, and then settle back down to a stable density. Some populations fluctuate a lot around the carrying capacity. So these are song sparrows. Um, they're nesting on Mandarty Island in British Columbia, but periodically there's really tough winters, really hard, harsh conditions that the birds simply cannot survive, so their population goes down. And then when weather is fairly stable, the population's numbers, numbers go up, then there'll be a super hard year, or a couple even, and the population number will go down. So that's, that's fluctuating quite a lot around the carrying capacity. So uh, the exact logistic model doesn't really fit uh, real populations, but it is very useful for estimating possible growth. But fluctuations that are caused by weather conditions, um, by other abiotic variables can skew population size. So the types of life, life history traits that are favored by natural selections vary with population density and environmental conditions. So if there is a species that tends to have uh, fewer, fewer offspring but live a long time, that's known as K selection, density dependent selection. So that, that selects for life history traits such as number of offspring, time of maturation, uh, such as number of offspring per individual, 
time of maturation, that's when individuals can first have offspring. Uh, these are sensitive to population density. So elephants, for example, uh, they have a large area required for feeding. Uh, they can't add a lot of offspring to the population without there being so much competition that there won't be enough food for, for the population. So that's a K-selected species. An R-selected species or R-selection is independent of density. So they select for life history traits that maximize reproduction. Um, an example of that, an example of that is say Daphnia. So let's see, our example here was elephants. Our example could be Daphnia. Daphnia are small invertebrates that live in streams. And this is population size. This is time. And they have a limited time for their population to explode. So they tend to explode exponentially like that. They have a very very high birth rate, very high birth rate, very early maturation. And the reason is that where they exist, which are in rivers and streams, is that the good times don't last for that long. They might last for a couple of months in the spring and maybe somewhat in the summer, but then after that, it doesn't, the population goes back down again. And then times are good, spring again, the population explodes. So uh, how can we write that? Daphnia respond to uh, limited time of resource availability. And these concepts are somewhat controversial. So they're a little bit simple. The thing about ecology especially, uh, but even biology is that you can ask any question and the person will say, well, it depends. <laughs> you know, it depends on other species in the area. It depends on the size of the habitat. It, it can depend on a lot of variables. So it is a bit of an oversimplification, K selection and R selection. Um, because populations are regulated um, by not only biotic factors, but also abiotic factors. So the birds on Mandardi Island, they're not just affected by density, they're affected by the weather. They're affected by winter, which can be quite hard on the population. So the general questions we're asking about population growth is what environmental factors stop a population from growing? Uh, why do some populations so radical fluctuations over time while others remain stable? So those are the two big questions that we ask. So I'm going to stop there. That's okay.